Hey guys, Scott Shefferman here with Sentinel One. I'm our principal security technologist here. I'm really looking forward to this, uh, this interview together. Let me give you an analogy. So I think by the year 2021, 95% of all vehicles sold in America, at least, uh, will be required to have this autonomous automatic braking uh, that a lot of vehicles have today. In fact, the car I own now has that, and I made sure it was a feature because I now have a five-year-old daughter I very much care about. Uh, and the question is, why would we have a mandate uh, like that? And the short answer is because it works. The fact that your car can put on the brakes um, infinitely better, infinitely faster uh, than a human, even one paying attention can, is remarkable. You can almost call this, uh, if, if I may, uh, in the world of AI, in the broader world of AI, this is kind of like a mini singularity that's happened when it comes to vehicles and vehicle safety. You know, let's talk about cybersecurity. Are we at a place where we have a mini singularity kind of equivalent? And I would argue that we do. Um, the main reason for that is because uh, just like your vehicle, I mean, if you think of what makes that work, well, sure, today is full of cloud technologies, but automatic braking is not one of them when it comes to a vehicle. Um, there's many sensors that, you know, take into consideration velocity, speed, impact. Uh, there's all sorts of local algorithms, in other words, local intelligence on the vehicle itself that says, stop now before there's an impact. And we allow that autonomous decision as a human to happen in our own vehicle that we're driving. So we've made that kind of quantum shift. So in cybersecurity, it's the same kind of thing. Do we have technologies now that we have enough intelligence local on the endpoint where, quite frankly, that's where the action happens, right? The endpoint is still the nexus of our entire cybersecurity problem. It's where data is uh, exfiltrated from. It's where data is created. It's where end users and identities live, personas, if you will, where they, they live. Uh, where they create content from. It's where uh, bad guys uh, target in order to uh, spearfish and gain access and move around the, you know, the, the environment via Active Directory. It's still the nexus of the security problem, that, that entire endpoint stack, whether it's a server, or whether it's a workstation, or whether it's a cloud load, or whether it's a VDI environment, whatever it is, it's an endpoint, right? So how do you get ahead of a threat that's automated? How do you get ahead of a threat that's moving at machine speed? How do you win this, uh, if you will, code on code warfare um, situation we find ourselves in? Well, the answer is, as good guys, we have to, we had to have pushed our intelligence down local to an endpoint to that edge, if you will, where we can make autonomous real time decisions to protect what you might call the integrity of all those running processes. Um, and you can't do that uh, relying entirely on cloud intelligence that's located, if you will, in the cloud, even the the uh, to and from transmission rate, the encryption overhead, the cloud compute that's remote, all of that is too much burden and overhead and ultimately latency, uh, never mind the tether reliance, um, to allow a vehicle to stop autonomously or allow an endpoint to defend itself against a real-time threat. So, um, yeah, the short answer is yes, I absolutely feel that we uh, have arrived at this place where we're in this renaissance of AI. We've, we've kind of chiseled away at this algorithmic science that allows us to downsize intelligence to something that can run locally from a, a resource uh, uh, standpoint, but also from a confidence standpoint. We actually can entrust endpoints to make these autonomous decisions without bringing down our whole networks. I don't think that was the case even three or four years ago for most organizations, and now it's actually assumed to be the case, and it's, uh, and it's, it's by and large the only way we're able to get ahead of the threat. So a lot of people ask me, uh, look, Scott, you've, you've got 15 years or so supporting the DOD warfighter and the DOD mission at large doing cyber things in that regard, uh, and you made a move over to the commercial vendor space. So, you know, why did you do it and what's it like now that you're here? And, and how would you describe some of those differences in, uh, in terms of a, a DOD organization and mission versus, let's say, a commercial enterprise or even a hospital mission um, or, or other types of missions that are just not DOD. The first thing I'll say is that the, the DOD tends to move a little slower because it's so large, but it also moves with a lot of intention. And a lot of that intention is because 
Um, you have to enable a large uh, worker force to do things that they're not fully trained on, that they're not specialized in, yet they're still responsible for. So your average, you know, security person in the DOD wears not just that hat, but wears many, many, many hats, and, and those hats change dynamically based on the mission and what they're uh, what they're doing. Um, so how do you enable a workforce like that? Well, you have to create standard operating procedures, you know, that are, that are written out uh, formally. That would be much like uh, the commercial space's IR playbooks, for example, that a lot of organizations are finally spending time doing um, on the heels of something like WannaCry, right? So, uh, but the other thing is like the DoD, if you write something down, it has to get done. Because if it doesn't get done, somebody's going to get in trouble and their career is going to be impacted, uh, you know, in the DoD. Um, whereas the commercial side, there's not a lot that's written down that says what you have to do or must do or shall do. Um, and to the extent that there is, there's a lot, well, there's a, um, a massive amount of gray area or subjectivity in terms of interpreting those requirements, answering a related audit, um, knowing whether or not you're beholden to a fine or a, or a slap on the wrist for something that you've done wrong. Um, by comparison, anyway, it's a, it's a lot less, in my mind, um, strict in that regard. So uh, there's there's a lot of lessons there. Um, one thing else I'll say about the DOD is is just the culture of transparent, direct communication, right? So you have to look someone in the eye in the DOD, whether it's an admiral or somebody that's a um, you know exactly your same level. You have to say, look. Um, I don't believe that what you're, you're, the way you're approaching this problem is correct. There's another way to look at it, or I'm observing something different than you are. Can we talk about it? Um, that takes a lot of courage. It also takes a lot of um, what I might call uh, having thick skin, uh, thicker skin than I often see in the commercial side. So take that for whatever it's worth. But I think there's a, there's a lot of value that you can have in DoD conversations that you almost just can't get in the commercial side a lot of times. Um, the last thing I'll say is, is kind of, let's extract this a little bit up from the personal aspect to um, the, the strategic side. So when you're fighting a war or doing an exercise, let's say in the DoD, you have to make a lot of quick decisions in the context of fighting an adversary. Um, a lot of people don't like to militarize cybersecurity, but I would disagree. I'd say there's so many parallels and lessons to be learned that, you know, the art of war, for lack of better words, definitely applies to both camps. And there's lessons to learn from both. And one of the best lessons I think that DoD does really well that commercial space is going to finally get their heads around of, out of necessity is the ability to make decisions without perfect information. And for that to be not only okay, but also to be the imperative, to be the strategy, to say, look, we have an event unfolding. We've got this subnet hit by this ransomware. It looks like it's spreading in some degree. I don't know the full aspect. I don't know the attribution. I don't know all the TTPs. I haven't even identified necessarily the ransomware that it is yet, but I'm going to take some proactive preemptive measure in spite of not having perfect information and take that ahead of the next bad thing that might happen. And you do that in warfare all the time. You never have enough perfect information. In fact, you want to have an intelligence report given to you that's fast, that's timely, you know, it's given to you quickly, that has that gives you just enough information, intelligence, and confidence to make a decision that matters. And um, I think you'll see in the rest of this interview, for example, that that's the state of cybersecurity today. And I don't think it's a uh, it's a far stretch to say that that's the state the way it is today. It's out of necessity, right? It's not because we want to be like the DOD or we think we need to be fast. It's because if we're not making those decisions fast enough, uh, we're kind of um, losing the, the fight against the adversary in any organization or mission that we serve. So that's a really, really good question. I mean, you just went to RSA this year and uh, there's just as many vendors as there were last time, maybe a few intended attendees based on the coronavirus. But long story short, I mean, we finally realized in the industry that in fact it does uh, behoove us to try to automate in order to actually do things faster to get ahead of the threat. I mean, at the end of the day, the SecOps challenge boils down to kind of one thing. Can I take a decision fast enough to matter before a bad thing happens or not? And everything else we do, around that problem space, if you will, all that X inefficiency, all that, all that noise, all that labor, all that alert fatigue, all that triage, all that requirements, um, answering the mail to requirements and, and compliance, etc. 
all of that is kind of the X factor, but the core problem we're trying to solve is can we do this faster with enough confidence to feel good about that? Uh, and I think we're getting there. I mean, if you look at like SIM technologies, um, two years ago at RSA, you talked to you know somebody at Splunk, they're like, oh, we're going to do all sorts of cool things like automation and uh, and orchestration, where you know a vendor app and a Splunk app in one area can actually uh, inform another Splunk app so that a user can say, you know, based on that, I want to take an action and 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 make do this query or take this action, right? So uh, that was kind of like you know all of this kind of started about two two years ago, meaningfully uh, in a meaningful way. But if you look at it, this these days in a, I mean, you have sims that are just spinning up left and right, able to fully, you know, integrate with other solutions that are now fully API built, um, that are running on microservices that can be updated, you know, at fast feature velocity to do things like take automated actions based on intel or confidence coming from another vendor signal, so that you can actually take and turn around and make an action that matters. Um, and so you have this ability to drive from endpoint and network devices and, and user visibility and Active Directory credential land, IDM land, if you will, drive that up to the cloud, quickly do compute and integrate and, uh, and then basically push down decisions in enough time to actually matter and get ahead of the threat. Now, I don't think we're fully there yet. I'm certainly we're not there when it comes to actually solving, let's say, um, the malware or living off the land uh, problem at the endpoint. Like we said earlier, that requires local intelligence. But when it comes to like getting your head around what's happening quickly, we're finally doing that in the cloud. We are also, we have pushing enough up. We're uh, doing all the things we need to do in the cloud to, to make that happen and to form somebody in a single day dashboard. Um, other areas that I'm really keen on are just looking at some of the, the browser memory protection, user user protection uh, in browser space memory, if you will, which traditional endpoint solutions have kind of struggled to, uh, to, to get their head around. Um, other things I like that we're doing to get ahead of the adversary are pushing our security further upstream ahead of the initial foothold an attacker might have, in other words, before the payload even hits, which would be things like automated patch management that actually works and doesn't break production and folds into a very disparate, you know, SDLC environment in, in large enterprises um, and gets through all those kind of organization challenges in order to actually patch things before the worm or the exploit or, or the uh, or or the financial actor hitting RDP vulnerability, you know, one, two, three of the uh, de jour actually happens. And I think um, that has been something that um, has been a pain in all of our sides for a long time. I'm really excited, for example, in the DoD, if they could just get patch management down in that kind of automated fashion, they're going to be you know, eons ahead of where they were when I was supporting them five, six years ago. So in general, uh, yeah, it, it gets down to are we doing things fast enough? Do we have enough confidence to do those things? And I think the short answer is yes, we're finally getting there. So as you can tell, I speak a lot about the speed of the adversary and how we're in this era of what you might call code unquote, code unquote warfare. And some of that might sound sensationalist. Some people might accuse me of, of using FUD language to talk about uh, threats that are automated um, that move really, really fast. And I would say, you know what guys, like it, until you've gone through a wanna cry or not patch experience or have had the Iranians root through a million device to network and you're trying to understand why after the fact and you look back and you see, you know what, I, I had all the tools I needed to contain this, but I didn't have the speed. I didn't have the ability to use those tools fast enough to get ahead and contain. Um, it, speed is like this invisible factor in everything that we do. And humans don't like to be pressured to work faster, even though that's, that's kind of become the mantra for today. Um, the problem is our mantra today is to do many, many things as fast as we can, such that we're overburdened, rather than focus on getting really good at doing the things that matter really, really fast, right? There's a big difference between those two things. So, um, people ask, so why, why does speed matter so much? Well, if you think um, it's a well-known story, that's why I'll reference it, but during uh, NotPetya, when Maersk uh, lost, what, 45,000 compute devices in less than 10 minutes, and the only reason their Active Directory wasn't kind of permanently burned to the ground was because of one power outage in South Africa where there was a remaining Active Directory controller that, that didn't get impacted because of the power outage. Were it not for that, that entire organization might have been exponentially more harmed 
uh, and its mission, its profits, the safety of its uh, people at, at sea, etc. All of those things would have been exponentially more impactful if it weren't for just a power outage in South Africa. And that happened in less than 10 minutes, the primary bulk of the, uh, of the damage. If you look at this new, uh, whatever, the coronavirus, the bulk of the impact of the viral load on the body happens in just five days. What happens is you're overwhelmed and you probably didn't get to the hospital soon enough. You probably didn't have the hydration you need, the ventilator you need, um, all the things that keep you alive when that thing's hitting in just five days. Well, in the cyber world, we don't have five days before maximum impact. We have minutes. In fact, we have less than a minute. If you look at ransomware like Maze, and I forget the numbers as I stand here, but if you look at how many processes the Maze ransomware kicks off that happen in less than one minute, it's in the hundreds or thousands. And these are things that are happening right on the host. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, how fa fast almost all these threats are able to spread via automated fashion, it's all happening in under well under a minute. And in fact, it's happening at a process microsecond level. And so the only way to get ahead of those impacts to your security posture that affect your actual impact to your operation, like the only way to get ahead of that is to actually be able to take those autonomous actions in real time to do that. You can't afford to say, oh, I saw all that happen in the past. I know what it is. I feel good as a human that I understand what it was, past tense. But that's too late. I mean, you've already had that subnet down or you've already had that ITAR network affected. You've already had your VDI environment get affected uh, sitting in, you know, uh, in, in between your mission critical and your production and your enterprise network. Like there's all sorts of things that will happen in just a few minutes that if you're not ahead of it, you've lost the, 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 the ground. You've lost the, the battle, if you will, of maintaining security control. And the reason why you've lost it is because you weren't able to take actions fast enough.